So you should be at the Hadoop crash course, and if that's where you think you're at, that's great. I was on the other side of the convention center thinking it was over there, so it was a nice little walk. Um, so part of the things, uh, who here got an email from me? Uh, so you pre-registered, you got an email from me explaining what you needed to do. Download the sandbox, get the environment. Okay, so who still needs to download the sandbox? Okay, so there's a couple USB keys here, right? So you know, feel free to come up and take one. Make sure that it doesn't walk away. I need them back. When you're done with it, uh, raise your hand or bring it back up to the front. Um, so, yep. Take, take one of them. The, these aren't free. I need them back. But, you know, take one, copy it, and then, uh, you know, bring it back here or, you know, raise it. These two cards will work, too. Yep. And so there's more people who need them. So either bring it back up here when you're done or raise your hand and see who else could use one. So they just, they just went out. So people start copying. When you're done, raise your hand or bring it up here. And then uh, the other folks, you know, please copy it from, from there. So here's it's a crash course. So this is going to be a rapid fire introduction into Hadoop. Um, so let me kind of like go through what's our plan. So the plan is that <clears throat> I'm going to kind of go through a quick overview for about 30 minutes and give you some basic introduction into Hadoop. And then really kind of uh, break into a hands-on session. And you know, um, I, I went to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and the, the model there was learn by doing. And I really believe that's, that's the way I learn. I, you know, I can listen for, you know, I can learn so much from listening, but until I do it, that's when I really get to learn it. So that's the objective is, you know, get you enough introduction so that you can kind of have some context and then kind of let's go into sort of learn by doing. So how many folks here, so, and, and the other thing I want to kind of uh, make sure people understand is this is an introduction to Hadoop, right? So, uh, and so that's what we're really trying to do here. So how many folks here have, uh, actually have a Hadoop environment that they uh, have access to today, before the sandbox? Okay. How many people have been playing with that for more than six months? Okay. So you're at the right place, right? This is the introduction area into Hadoop. Okay, so I'm going to cover uh, why Hadoop very quickly, then kind of go a little bit into the Hadoop ecosystem, and then we'll kind of go transition into the lab. So let's... Uh, you know, there's often a question that gets asked, and you know, uh, there's you know big statements that are made. You know, oh, Hadoop is transformational, right? You know, it's disrupting the data center. You know, so is Hadoop really the one disrupting the data center? And so I, I would beg to sort of differ from that, really, because Hadoop's sort of a response, right? It's the data, right? The data is the one that's disrupting the data center, right? The data that is driving the need to have a different approach, right? And that data is coming from multiple ways, whether it's social data. So I just came back from the Hadoop, uh, the Dev Cafe, right? And they have a, a, a live uh, demo there where they're using Hadoop to capture in real time hashtag Hadoop Summit tweets, and they're analyzing it in real time, right? So social media is sort of one, uh, you know, very common use case where you know the, the volume and the type of data sort of needs could lend itself to a different approach. You know, mobile space, right? So these mobile applications, so that the mobile space, whether it's uh, generating more data or it's you're leveraging some of the sensors within your mobile device could be a, t a challenge for folks. Uh, cloud sometimes can be an enabler, right? Uh, to kind of quickly move it on to the, some of this technology. And lastly is uh, Internet of Things, right? So if you were listening to the keynotes, uh, there was a lot of sort of focus uh, this year around Internet of Things. So having all these devices, right? Whether they're medical devices, our devices in your cars, devices in your home. These devices <clears throat> are collecting the data, are streaming it back, and, they, and we have a sort of an opportunity to be smarter with them. So <clears throat> as, as we look at sort of the, the, the world of, of data, right, and this you know, transformation that's happening with the data, you know, what, the traditional sort of places where you capture data, where there's systems of records in their ERP, CRM, CRM, sometimes have these various challenges, right? Some of the challenges around, you know, the, the, the constraints on uh, data in a specific application, right? So if it's a structured, uh, if you're collecting structured data and you put it into a relational database and, you know, your application fits that paradigm, that's great. 
But what if it's social? What if it's JSON? What if it's unstructured? What do you do then, right? Or, uh, you know, I, I have my data, but really if I, I, I'm looking to kind of generate new insights, right, to be smarter with my data, to be able to change my business, to be data-driven, right, I need to be able to have access across, you know, different silos of data, right? So I need to, one way to kind of do integration is to bring the data together, right? Um, and we talked about rich data types. And lastly, uh, as we look at data, you know, it, it needs to scale, right? So, you know, let's take a closer look at that. So, see, these are some of the different data types that are sort of emerging, that are sort of pushing the boundaries in data. And, you know, in this chart you saw in, in the keynotes, so I have a particular angle on it. So, you know, here, here's your traditional, and, and data has an intrinsic property, right? And that intrinsic property is that if you build a data system, data grows, right? You know, more transactions happen, more interactions happen, and they grow. And they grow at a particular rate. Now, as you're looking at these new sort of data types coming into your system, there's an inflection, right? It's not growing at the same rate. So the, your ability to use your existing systems to consume that can be challenging. So what does that mean? So there's your ability to consume that data, right, within your enterprise. So maybe you have a particular infrastructure today, and it gives you a certain ability to consume that data. But there's a gap between your ability to consume the data and the data that you have access to. And that gap, what that gap creates is, you know, I like to call it the enterprise blind spot. So you have an opportunity to be smarter. You have an opportunity to be data-driven, right, to drive your business by insight you're connecting from your data, but you have a blind spot, right? Because if you, if you don't have an infrastructure, or you don't have a system that can consume that data to then do the processing, then you're sort of driving with a big blind spot where there's could be opportunities or challenges coming your way, right? And that really kind of all lend itself to Hadoop, right? So Hadoop is a system where I can consolidate the data sets, I can have batch interactive streaming of data, you know, it integrates with sort of my existing infrastructure, and lastly, it's scalable, right? And, and, in, and through this, we'll kind of get into the, you know, how is it, is it, is it that it's scalable? So, <clears throat> We want to, we have this goal, right? We want to be data driven. We want to close that enterprise, enterprise blind spot. So we, we've heard of this thing, Hadoop. You came to the core, some of you have installed it. Fantastic, Hadoop seems like a good technology for my particular business problem that can help me going, right? But it's not magic, right? It's gonna take some time to kind of get to this goal of a, a, to be data driven, right? So part of that goal is this, you know, sometimes we call that the data lake where we've created this infrastructure, where we're able to store the data at volume, store different types of data, right, store different varieties of data, and be able to get insight from that, right, and that insights can come in batch, interactive, or streaming. But how do we get from, hey, I need a crash course in the Hadoop, to being data-driven, right? And really, there's two paths that we see, right? First path is sort of the classic path of, hey, how can I use Hadoop to help me save money, right? To help me make my existing systems a little bit more efficient, right? And sometimes this is where you hear about EDW augmentation. So maybe looking at cold data from your warehouse, looking at, uh, you know, uh, ETL jobs that are maybe uh, consuming more processing uh, uh, in your warehouse that you might want to figure out how to better optimize. And the other really sort of approach to kind of, uh, kind of getting to that data lake that's driving you is these advanced analytic apps. Right, so whether you're doing uh, sentiment analysis uh, or uh, advanced analytics, you know, there's a lot of talk. There was a demo on uh, Spark and Zeppelin, right, and you're a data scientist and you want to do some of these advanced analytics. So you have these two drivers, right? You can either, you know, try to use Hadoop. What's your motivation? I want to get to the data lake, but, you know, what's going to drive you? Is it cost optimization? Is it advanced analytics? Is it both, right? And so as we look at you know, these motivations, you know, these motivations really, we tend to see like, you know, four classic on-ramps, right? So I kind of think of it as like, you know, Hadoop is your super data highway, right? And, you know, you're at the, here, you're at the, the, the entry point the, uh, to that data highway. So what's your on-ramp, right? So these are your on-ramps, right? So you can look at, you know, we talked about that data architecture optimization, or, you know, maybe it's data discovery, right? Maybe you're trying to deal with data that's either growing at a particular volume, coming in at a particular velocity, right? Or it sort of doesn't fit within your current and existing infrastructure. So that's our data discovery use case. 
The other one could be a single view, right? And uh, you know, many of us are part of companies, so we either have customers, you know, in the case of a doctor, you know, we have patients. We want to, we have some data that we collect about that patient. So there's data within my enterprise, and there's data outside of my enterprise, right? And I want to leverage all of that data to have a better insight into my particular customer, how I can serve them, what are their challenges, right? And, and how can I potentially offer them uh, a better service? And lastly, really, is the sort of predictive analytics. Right? Can I collect this data, use this data to better understand and, and not just react, but predict and, and be proactive in, in, in how I engage with those customers? Okay, so that's my uh, quick introduction. So in the next 20 minutes, we're gonna go to we're going to go through 23 projects, going to open up some source code, and hope you're ready to kind of have that introduction. So with that, we're going to kind of cover HBase, we're going to cover Ambari, we're going to cover uh, Zookeeper, and many of these technologies. And then we can cover Hadoop, Uzi, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, we're not going to do that, okay? There is a lot of technology out there. We're going to kind of take a high-level sort of introduction in, into that kind of technology. We're going to start with the basics, right? And, and, and so instead of diving into all these projects, kind of getting yourself overwhelmed, and that happens a lot, I, I want to try to give you sort of a more guided introduction in, into Hadoop, right? So let's start with the, the basics. So you have a computer that stores data and does processing, right? And so we talked about existing systems and challenges with existing systems and doing data processing. And so you could try to get a, a bigger computer, right? Or another approach to kind of deal with this is, can I have a collection of computers, right? And that's the Hadoop's approach. Can I, can I have a, a, a collection of computers to help me scale? So on each of these computers, there's an individual CPU and there's an individual disk, right? And, and I want to use them as a collection whole to do sort of processing. So one of the things, the first thing that needs to happen is I need an abstraction layer across these computers to do, uh, to store the data, right? To, uh, and, and these computers are commodity hardware that allows me to a cost-effective way to scale that data, right? And then also, I want to be able to use those CPUs across those different computers to do computation on the data. So as we look at computation, we need a framework, an approach to abstract doing the computation uh, across the cluster, right? So we have this distributed computing framework, right, that's gonna do research management, right? Because I have multiple machines, I might have multiple users and multiple workloads, I want to use those uh, efficiently to kind of be, to, to be able to give me the performance I'm expecting from my application, right? And, and the other concept here is data locality. So I have the data across a cluster. It's not, doesn't mean that it's on every machine. So depending on the data you're, you're working with, it's on some machines and not other machines. And so there's this global sort of uh, uh, directory into like, well, where is the data, right? And so part of data locality is I need to find out where's my data but I, you know, there's this whole concept of data gravity, right? So I, I don't, I want to reduce the amount of data movement that I need to do to do computation. So as I want to do processing on the data, I want to figure out where the data is, and instead of moving the data to the computation, I want to move the computation to the data, right? And so we have this concept of data locality that this framework is going to help us uh, leverage to do, the, to do that computation. And you can think of this as a data operating system, right? So, you know, in the keynote, you heard about data operating system, you, you know, you heard this concept yarn, but that's really the, 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 the service it provides, right? And this data operating system is gonna be focused around data processing, and it's gonna give you three services. You know, the classic one is around batch processing of the data. The next one is around interactive, and lastly is around streaming, right? And, and then you, you have these sort of different approaches as you can do computation on that data, and you're gonna have a series of data access engines, right? And these different data access engines are gonna give you different approaches. Whether it's a SQL approach, whether it's a NoSQL approach, whether it's a new SQL approach, or whether it's some other approach. You know, maybe you're doing search, right? So you're gonna have, because you have different data, you have a variety of data, you have a different types of applications and challenges, you wanna have the flexibility of using uh, different tools to be able to interact with that data, right? <clears throat> and then, as you're kind of looking at incorporating this into the enterprise, clearly we need to have an approach for security that matches our requirements within our enterprise. And lastly, it's you know, governance, right? So who's, who, who's accessing that data? What did they do? When did they do it? 
right? Because it, you know, if we're, as we're dealing with data and as we're dealing with mission critical data, enterprise data, you know, there's, an, there's a, a requirement, a mandate to have governance across that. And then you, know, you have the applications that are sort of built on top of that. So there's, so I, I, let me see, I, I count the, the data management sort of layer, data access engine, governance, security, there's one more pillar here. Operations, right? So as I'm dealing with hundreds to thousands of machines, I need to have an easy way to kind of work with this without necessarily having, having to, the need to hire an army of uh, sort of administrators, right? So we, we're gonna have an operation sort of abstraction here so we're gonna be able to scale and make it easy to, to operate. So let's, uh, too many clicks. All right, so that kind of gives us into Hadoop. So Hadoop is this multi-tenant, so uh, architecture that's, it's a multi-tenant centralized architecture uh, for shared enterprise services, right? And so we talked about, you know, the resource management, scalable storage, and then really there's this collection of operation security and governance, really, that makes it sort of the enter, when people talk about enterprise Hadoop, you know, it's, it's really these operation security and governance that give us that, you know, enterprise flavor. So let's take a deeper, now let's go, there's a 20,000 foot level, let's kind of drop down to the little 10,000 foot level. So if we look at those five pillars, right, um, really what we see is our storage layer, right, within uh, Hadoop, that the distributed storage environment, the distributed storage environment, it's called HDFS, the Hadoop Distributed File System, right? And that came and inspired from, you know, the Google File System, right? Our data operating system is called Yarn, and then we have this whole collection of data access engines, right? That, you know, whether you're trying to do SQL with something like Hive, or you're doing a real time with Storm, this is a, the, the different tools that gives you the flexibility to kind of work with the different varieties of data, right? And then we have the security and operations and governance, right? So we focus on vertical integration to make sure we, for the application, that we can do the data access and do it efficiently and scale and have the flexibility that your requirements need. And we wrap them with sort of vertical integration. Right, with those enterprise features necessary to kind of uh, be able to leverage this within an enterprise. So, <clears throat> so let's take a, now we've gone for 20,000 foot to 10,000 foot, maybe now we're gonna get into a, 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 a thousand foot sort of layer. So we looked at that, there's that one machine and then we have multiple machines across the sort of our environment we, and the collection of those machines we refer to as a cluster. So if we take a deep dive into one of these machines, each of those machines again has a disk CPU and memory and so there's certain services that go on those machines, right? And so as we look at HDFS, right, there's, uh, there's this data node, right? And the data node is where the, 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 the data is actually stored, right? And, you know, this node we often refer to as the worker node. And then in that same node, we, we talked about this concept of data locality. It needs, a, it needs to know, uh, as I want to do computation, it needs to be smart enough to know where, that, uh, where the data is and who's busy and who's not busy and to kind of, to make it efficient and, uh, and to maximize your utilization, right? So, you know, these are a bunch of services that are on there. So as we look at HDFS, you know, so we talked about the name node. And so, um, so we, this is the worker node. And so there's a lot of these worker nodes in our cluster environment. And there's a couple of these master nodes, these, these nodes that have a, a, a more global understanding and play a, a bigger role in your environment. So one of those is the name node, right? So the name node is the one that says, I know where the data is across a cluster, right? Uh, and, you know, as I want to do computation, it says, hey, I have a job to do computation, you know, data operations says I want to have computation, you know, it can talk to the data node that says it knows where it is, and the, the resource manager knows, hey, I'm actually doing work on these nodes, and these other nodes don't have any work, right? So it does your sort of utilization across that. So as we look at Hadoop, right, is this collection of these nodes, machines, right, that kind of build out a cluster, right? And as you look at that cluster, you're gonna have many of these worker nodes, right? And then you're gonna have a few or a couple, depending on your architecture setup, of these master node services to do sort of coordination uh, across, uh, across your cluster, right? And you know, together these things, you know, we, we often think of it as sort of core Hadoop, right? And in core Hadoop, you, you have, HDSF, right, for your storage, you have Yarn, and you have uh, Hadoop Common, right? So we're gonna talk uh, a little bit more about these things, but as we look at, you know, uh, 
Well, wow, that's a great concept, right? I have multiple machines. I can you know, distribute my data across these machines. I have this intelligent data operating system that knows what nodes are busy, which ones are not busy. This is fantastic. Well, uh, it is fantastic. However, as you, you know, deal with a cluster of machines, you know, how many folks have, here have had a, a hard drive failure? Right? So, hey, the concept of let's use commodity hardware that's you know, relatively cheaper hardware, and we're, we want lots of it, and we want to scale it up, but there's, there's a reality of you know, the, you know, hard drives fail. Right? And as we kind of try to uh, scale up this environment, we have to deal with these challenges. So you know, we, have, we want this framework to give us this processing capability and scalability, but we also want us to, to prevent some of these challenges for us, right? And the, and the great thing is HDFS does this, right? So one of the ways it does it, so if you, if you have a, a failure in your, in your hard drive or in, your, in a machine, uh, you know, it's distributed reliable storage, right? HDFS is distributed reliable storage. It's, why is it reliable? Because it actually is making multiple copies. So when you load data into Hadoop, you're actually going to make three copies of the data, right? And that three copies of the data, the, um, the, the, the name node knows where those three copies are. And the resource manager in Yarn, it knows where the different copies are. So not only does it give it, you know, your sort of, uh, you know, fault tolerance in your file system, but, you know, the fact that you have multiple copies improves the, your ability to do processing, right? You get more I.O., right? So there's... There's more processes that can operate on the data because it actually has multiple copies. So, and Hadoop leverages that to give you the processing capability at scale. So, you know, as you add new, new data, it gets broken into blocks and it gets distributed in your cluster, right? And this, you know, uh, there's an algorithm and Hadoop transparently you know, takes care of this for you, right? So you add data and it just sort of happens. You know, a machine goes down, it, it knows how to recover from that and, and redistribute the data within across your cluster. Right, so we talked about this name node and the data nodes. You know, there's constant communication back and forth. It knows where the data is sort of replicated, right? And you know, it keeps a kind of heartbeat. If a heartbeat kind of goes cold, it, it keeps checking. And if it does, and if it tries, and then it, it has multiple copies of the data, so it figures out how to redistribute the data across the cluster. So <clears throat> as we look, uh, as we start thinking of Hadoop, and you know, depending when you started looking at Hadoop. You know, one of the first things, uh, there's sometimes a very strong association between Hadoop and MapReduce, right? So, you know, the, the, the classic, uh, the Google paper, you know, talked about the Google file system and Google MapReduce, which sort of inspired, you know, the HDFS distributed file system, Hadoop distributed file system, and, and, and Hadoop MapReduce. And so the, the interesting thing about MapReduce is a framework. So we talked about data locality, right? Because one of the challenges we want to deal with, in, instead of moving data to the Processing or moving data to your analytics, so connecting to a warehouse, you know, using an ODBC JDBC connection to move data to your OLAP server, right? You know, or move the data to some you know analytics server, move some set set of the data over, and then do the processing. In Hadoop, we want to move the processing, the analytics, to the data, right? And and Hadoop is a framework that allows you to do that, and allows you to do that at scale, right? Uh, it's, it's very effective. It's been around for a long time. And it's classically, you know, uh, the, the capabilities gives you to do batch processing on the data. Now, there's batch interactive in real time. So, oh, well, I have interactive in real time. Does that mean I just throw sort of batch away? No, right? I mean, there's still very valid use cases where batch is a very effective, efficient, and the right tool for the right problem, right? And, and one thing you'll know with Hadoop, because there's multiple data access engines, as you start looking at developing your application, you want to figure out what's the what's my problem and what tool do I, that best helps me fix that problem. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about how uh, uh, MapReduce works, right? So MapReduce works by you know breaking a large problem into subproblems. So I had a large problem. I had this room of 50 people that you know they got the email, some didn't, and we're supposed to download um, the VM. Right? And I needed to get everyone on there. So I could take a couple approaches. I could come in with one key and wait till it gets copied, copied. By the way, uh, does anyone else still need a copy? Right? Does anyone have keys that kind of gives a couple of those folks? Yeah, the doc file's on there too. Okay. 
So one approach is to kind of do it seriously. Oh, here's, here's one up here. And the other approach is to kind of do it in parallel, right? So what, what did I do? I, I, I created multiple keys, put it out in parallel, right, and did the computation. Another sort of approach I'm looking at that is we have about maybe 50-ish people here in the room, right? And in your, pocket, in your pockets, you probably have some change. And I wanted to figure out how I can count how many nickels we have in everyone's pocket in this room, pocket or purse. How's that? And, um, and you know, again, we could take that problem and do it serially and kind of go one by one, or we kind of do it sort of, try to do it via sort of a parallel, sort of parallel processing approach. So if I'm going to take a parallel processing approach, I want to count sort of nickels, I can kind of go in here and say, okay, look, I want to break my problem into, um, into a smaller subproblem. And my smaller, smaller subproblem is going to be this. I'm going to have multiple computations happen, and, and I want to count each of these rows. I want to count nickels, and I have a process that counts nickels in each of these individual rows. So I'm going to count nickels, I'm going to count nickels, I'm going to count nickels, so that, you know, dividing my problem, my big problem into a subproblem is kind of the, the map phase. So I do the counting, it happens in, in parallel, and so out the other end is a whole sort of, okay, how many nickels in this row? How many nickels on that row? How many nickels in this row? But I have the problem of, I don't want to know per row, I want to know how many nickels across, across everybody. So what I need to do is sort of collect all those different counts of nickels, and then actually do an aggregation. So why do we go through that exercise? Because that's exactly what MapReduce does, right? So I want to iterate over a large number of records. I want to extract something interesting, right? So in this case, in our example, we want to extract, we want to count nickels. Now there's much more interesting things that you can do, right? But uh, we're going to do that. And then there's a shuffle phase, right? So I, I do that processing, and then I need to bring the, the subsets of the data, the results together, right? So I want to sort intermediate routes. And then I want to do reduce, which I do the, that's when I reduce, I do the aggregation, right? So I do the summarization, filter, or transformation on, so, on those intermediate results, and then I can sort my, my result, right? So kind of how does that look? I have a bunch of data out there. I want to do some processing, so I want to move my processing to my data, right? I do that processing, then uh, that processing happens, I do a reduce, or I do a shuffle, and then I do the reduce. Right, and I get my, and uh, get output another sort of piece of data. Okay, so you know, let's go through a, another example of, of of how MapReduce works. So uh, the mapper reads data from HDFS. So in this case, you know, this is the classic, you know, it, you know, when you're programming, there's often the hello world, right? You know, I, I just want to get it to print something on the screen and make something basic happen. In data processing, in particular distributed processing, it seems nowadays it's like the classic thing is like, I want to do a word count. I have all these large documents, right? And, and maybe because of the, the association with Google and Yahoo and having the index of the web, right? There is this need to kind of say, I have all these documents, I have all these words, I want to sort of find unique words, right? And this is the classic hello world example with Hadoop. So I have the data in my distributed file system. I want to read the file blocks, uh, uh, you know, and I do it line by line, right? And so, uh, you know, we break, we break the problem into sort of individual lines, right? And then I want to uh, split the lines into tokens, right? And then, you know, you have this key value pairs. So I say, hey, I have here are the individual words, and I have a value, because there's one of them, right? So I want to do a shuffle. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move that data around so that I want to, you know, I would take all my keys and, and bring them to the same place. And so I, I, with those keys, I bring the data together, and then I do a reduce. And I'm going to do an aggregation. And then I can count how many words are in my document. That's MapReduce. OK, so that's great. right? So we have HDFS, we have MapReduce, we're moving the computation to the data. Fantastic. But you know, this is really Hadoop 1. right? So in Hadoop 1, you have HDFS, you have batch as your way to kind of interact with the data, right? and then uh, as you wanted to bring more applications and more users, uh, you, you didn't have this multi-tenant sort of environment, right? This shared resources uh, to do this. And you only had one approach, right? It's like, hey, my computation framework, it's only batch. So you know, this is sort of created silos uh, with the distinct use cases. So it's batch only, single purpose clusters, 
you know, difficult to uh, integrate with the sort of existing uh, uh, investments and not enterprise grade, right? And this is sort of like the bad rap, or it's, I don't know if a bad rap, but it, it's the rap that Hadoop one got, right? And, and the developers, you know, four or five, six years ago, uh, the open source community in Apache sort of noticed this and started reacting to that. It says, hey, you know, Hadoop does these good things. We have these challenges. Now, how can we make Hadoop more flexible? Right? And that's what really drove you know, Hadoop 2. So as we, before we kind of get into Hadoop 2, so you know, this is a common, you know, and we, you hear that sort of analogy of a data operating system, right? But this is a common pattern that happens with operating systems. Right? You have the first generation of operating systems and it's single purpose, right? So if, if you look at Windows 3.1 or you know, iOS 5 or 6, right? They're sort of single purpose operating systems, right? And you know, if I'm my Windows 3.1 machine, it's like, oh, finally I have a PC. You know, I went to college with, you know, with the Windows 3.1. And um, it's like, I'm doing Excel, it's fantastic. Oh wait, I want to listen to music. Wait, I can't do that at the same time, right? I can't, you know, I can't actually do multitasking, right? And then operating systems become more flexible because they want better utilization across those environments, right? And they become a, a multitasking operating system. So just like uh, Hadoop started, uh, in which batch oriented with single oriented application, so the reaction into to that data operating system is to make it a uh, multitasking, right? A multi-tenant operating system, right? And and so Hadoop one, you have HFS storage, and what happened is your your computation framework was MapReduce. So in that there was the API, there was the execution engine, right? And there was a resource management, and all that was together in MapReduce. So if we want to open it up to more execution engines, more data access engines, have flexibility, and have uh, uh, more workloads happening on this environment, we need to break that apart, right? A one approach is to break it apart, and that's exactly what happened with Hadoop 2, right? So in Hadoop 2, you know, the, the tightly coupling happened in MapReduce, things got split up into sort of multiple pieces. So Yarn became the resource manager, right? And so now there's, you know, multiple applications that you can run. You can still run MapReduce, but now MapReduce is just one of many sort of APIs you can use. And it, you know, now it also opens up to have different approaches to have an execution engine. So you can use you know, batch MapReduce, or you can use sort of tests to do processing. Right? And this is starts opening up MapReduce from, from just being sort of this batch-oriented system to being interactive to sort of being streaming also. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about Tez. So you know, with MapReduce 2, um, you know, as we wanted to move from batch to interactive, we wanted to have a, a more efficient way to, to do pro processing on my data. Uh, let me see, yeah. So as, as we want to look at sort of being uh, more efficient in processing my data, so look at uh, MapReduce. So when you wanted, to, here's a SQL operation, right? So you have a SQL operation, you want to do processing on that, uh, that, that, uh, that data set. That SQL operation is going to generate a series of MapReduce jobs. So it's not just one MapReduce job. So you know, our example is like we're sort of like it's one super MapReduce job. When you do doing processing in Hadoop, it's really sometimes a collection of MapReduce jobs, right? So you uh, start doing some MapReduce, and then you spill the, the the intermediate results to disk HDFS. Then you read it again and do a MapReduce, and you spill it to disk, and then you do sort of um, MapReduce again. So when talk about when people talk talking about you know Hadoop one and being batch oriented and being slow, you know part of the, the challenge here is you're you're having these intermediate results and you're going out and spilling the disk again and again. So what Tez does is you're still doing MapReduce, but you know sometimes this is referred to as MapReduce reduce. So instead of spilling to disk in between, right, where you're losing a lot of efficiency, can we keep it in memory? Pass that, you know, that, that result to the next sort of operation that needs to happen, and, uh, and then continue with the processing. So this is where the, the notion com uh, comes around map reduce reduce, which is much more efficient, and which is opening up Hadoop to becoming interactive. So you know, uh, with you know, Hadoop 2, instead of having these silos where you're sort of having a particular application working with, uh, with map reduce uh, and Hadoop 1.0, now you have uh, Hadoop 2 Plus, where you have uh, uh, a data operating system that's multitasking with multiple en execution engines, multiple data access approaches, that sort of uh, all sort of in a, in a centralized architecture. 
So we have processing, we have storage, you know, we put that together. So we have MapReduce Yarn plus HDFS, right? And so you think of Hadoop Core, that's really what it is. And this is sort of leverage sort of to, to build a sort of modern data architecture, right? So, you know, one of the things is, you know, this, your, your data system, you know, is big data new data? I, I don't, I'm not sure, right? I, I think many, you know, there's been, sensors have been around for a long, ta a long time, right? It's just the, the volume, the variety, the velocity of that data. What's happening with that data, that's what's changing. It's not that it's completely new data. It's, it's that, you know, you know, those characteristics have changed. And, and your interest and in, in your ability to consume that has changed. Right, so you want to sort of coexist your sort of Hadoop environment with existing applications and resources. And so you, you want to have this, you, you, you want to figure out how to use the right tool for the right problem. And, and you know, that kind of leads itself to a modern data architecture where you, have, you leverage Hadoop to do, you know, centralize the, your data to do uh, b um, large analytics at scale. But you're, you're still having existing other data systems that you want to sort of integrate and, uh, and augment. So now I want to talk a little bit about data access. And I think I have a few slides on data access and we'll kind of move to start getting started. Does anyone still need the VM? Oh, look at that. My MapReduce job was pretty good. Uh, except for, you know, I did MapReduce and my results didn't get very far. So at some point, you know, I want the keys back when you get a chance. I keep saying they have, you know, the, the, these keys have little legs that walk away. Um, so a data access, so we, we want to have this flexible uh, approach to be able to deal with a variety of data and interact with it in, in multiple approaches. Okay, so, so we talked about sort of MapReduce and Batch. We talked about Tez and how that sort of opens up Hadoop to sort of interactive and the sort of real-time use cases. So as you look at uh, doing this kind of processing uh, and you look at those 20 plus charts, you know, so, oh, Batman, too much stuff, right? You know, you can start breaking that stuff into sort of groups. So as you look at doing batch processing, you know, many times you think of uh, MapReduce, Pig, and Hive. On an interactive, you have things like Solar, Spark, and Hive. Wait, did I say that was batch? Oh, wait, what happens is you can use Hive to do either sort of batch processing or you can use Hive to do interactive. And how does that happen? Well, you can you run, and we'll cut into Hive. You can run Hive with MapReduce, or you can map, run Hive with Tez. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And then you have sort of real time. So uh, you know, as we started kind of having uh, processing with Hadoop, so there's this, so MapReduce is this Java framework that you can do, uh, you know, uh, do processing with your data, and you can learn that API and start developing applications. But how many people really want to do that? And that maybe I don't want to think of my problem in, in, in that fashion. I want to have some abstraction. So, you know, people started building abstractions on top of MapReduce, on top of some of this infrastructure. And Pig was one of the abstractions developed really early on by Yahoo. It says, uh, and, and Pig started says, hey, Pig generates a series of MapReduce jobs, right? But instead of having to think of MapReduce, I, I can think of more of my, my data flow. I want to do this, I want to do, and then process it in this way, and I want to process it that way. And it, you know, it, it becomes a little bit more declarative without having to think about how that processing is happening. So you know, many times PIG fits into this idea of sort of being uh, a language to help you with uh, transforming data. When you deal with PIG, the actual language itself is referred to as PIG Latin. Right? And you know, classically, you know, PIG generates uh, MapReduce jobs. And we'll see that as we do the tutorials. Right? We talked about that. So the thing, as, uh, the thing to note uh, uh, is that um, as you work with PIG, um, there's a plan that gets generated, and then through the lab you'll see the plan, and uh, you know, it's sort of lazy execution, so it doesn't get executed until you run a dump or a store. And the, the nice thing about uh, PIG is that uh, <laughs> this dump and store makes it really easy sort of to debug. So it dumps, you know, dumps it to your screen, store kind of persists it to, down to, um, to disk, right? So let's kind of look at an example of you know, using PIG. So I have these two data sets uh, from various data sources. Uh, and what I want to kind of, and they're, they're data sets of web, web hits, right? And I want to figure out, you know, what are my five most popular uh, sort of websites? So here's a PIG job, right? So at the end, I want to output my five top websites. 
I have multiple inputs, right? So uh, I have one input uh, of users, and I have another input of pages. And I want to uh, you know, declare a variable for those users and those pages, and then I want to apply a predicate, right? So here you're not looking at a map reduce sort of API. Here you're sort of looking at a more declarative language to do processing on it. It's fairly high level and straightforward to kind of work with. Then I can do sort of join operations. I can do a group by, so I want to group by the URLs. Then I want to do a certain processing as I kind of go through it. As I do the processing, at some point I want to do sort of an ordering of that. And at the end, I really want to say, I have that order, I want to find those top five websites. Right? And, and then I want to dump them back out to a file. So I do a store, and at that point I actually just sort of do the execution and, and persist it back out. So you know, what does a pig architecture look like? So you have Hive, I think I jumped one to be chart there. So I'm gonna talk about Hive. So as we looked at abstractions, you know, there's MapReduce, there's Hive as the abstraction on top of MapReduce. The other abstraction that happened very quickly was SQL, right? Because SQL is the, the lingual front. How many folks here are familiar with SQL? There we go. So, you know, hey, you bring SQL to Hadoop and guess what? You have, you know, this large room of audience of folks who can actually use SQL to do, to do data processing in Hadoop, right? So it's, you know, uh, it, SQL 92 plus compliant. You know, it's shipped with every distribution. It's proven to sort of uh, to work at scale. You know, from petabytes, uh, terabytes, petabytes to exabytes, and you know, you can you make it use it for both batch and interactive, right? And you know, the nice thing about SQL is that there's a whole sort of infrastructure around it that kind of allows you to do that processing. So what, the, the the architecture for Hive is you have a Hive server uh, that kind of brings in, that can listen to different connections. Uh, you have your sort of engine that do the processing. There's some metadata that gets stored, right? So when you define some tables, uh, you know, where do those, you know, what tables get defined, what are the columns, you know, what's that catalog, that metadata? There's a meta store that kind of stores that and actually uses a, a relational database to, to, to store that. And then there's your sort of your engine itself, right? I can choose between either a MapReduce or a test uh, compilation, and then uh, it goes through an optimization and there's an execution that happens. Right? And then th that execution gets sort of run across your Hadoop cluster using uh, HCFS and MapReduce. So uh, we talked about TES, and you have this flexibility. So Hive is this abstraction to talk about MapReduce, but Hive is, uh, can also work with TES. So it's, oh, does that mean I have to rewrite it? No, it's actually pretty nice. All you gotta do is flip one little switch, and instead of uh, you know, generating Hive MapReduce jobs, you're gonna be generating Hive test jobs. So in the lab that you do today, you'll be uh, generating Hive test jobs sort of by default, right? And you're looking at some of the query plans that get sort of uh, computed from it. So you know, uh, there's a you know this growing uh, ca capability of SQL, right? So uh, you know, Hive has been uh, uh, a fast-growing project, adding uh, rich SQL support, uh, improving uh, performance, and improving scalability, right? I think we're now at high 14, and you know, we're sort of looking at, at you know, the roadmap beyond high 14. Right, so um, we have different sort of optimizations that are happening. So Hive actually works with a whole ecosystem of Apache projects. Um, one thing that we talked a little bit about TESS, so ORC is sort of a, a, a file format that you know, Hive can exploit for high performance. So as you go through your lab today, you're gonna be doing uh, some Hive, uh, you're going to use a Hive SQL processing, and you're going to use a TES execution engine, and you're going to initially store it in sort of a raw format, so you're going to stage data in, in a raw format, and then you're going to do a little optimization and, and put that into ORC, right? So we're going to learn how to do that through the, the, the lab today. All right, so now you have, so these multiple data access engines, you know, because of time we can't cover that many more today, you have Yarn as a data operator system that kind of can hold them and do resource management across them. And you have HCFS, which is your central repository of data, right? That can, that's fault tolerant and scale, that can scale. Okay, so, you know, uh, I can use Hive or Pig, you know, and there's actually multiple, uh, multiple tools that you can use. You know, so Hive is nice because it's, it's SQL, and as we know, everyone here is very familiar with SQL. But, you know, sometimes, you know, trying to do transformation on data there's sort of other approaches that could let itself uh, either uh, easier to think about the problem or solve the problem using that tool. And you know, you know, if you're assuming doing transformation, you know, pig is a nice job. So in our lab today, we're gonna start with Hive, 
And then we're going to start doing some transformation on our data. I'm going to use pig to do that transformation, do the transformation and dive it back into a, a hive table and then do sooner for further querying processing. Right? And, and that's, you know, sort of this example. It's like I can maybe, there's a, there's a tool called Scoop. And Scoop is, you know, uh, you can think of SQL for Hadoop. Scoop, right? So I want to move data. So Scoop is a tool to move data so I can connect to existing relational data sources, use that to, uh, to pull data efficiently into Hadoop, so pull it into HDFS. So today in your lab, you're going to get some data. You need to put it into HDFS. Maybe you start by doing some raw exploration of that data using sort of Hive. You maybe need to do some transformation on the data early. So you can use pig to do that. Uh, and then once you've kind of uh, done the transformation, done the cleansing, get, got to the appropriate stage, you can do a, a, a lot of high for processing. But that data, once it's in your environment, it's, it's not limited just to doing Hive or Pig. If you wanted to come in with Spark, right, and do sort of uh, machine learning on that data, that data now is available for you to do that also. So, you know, that was a very sort of um, simple and straightforward uh, sort of ETL process. This is a much richer process that kind of gets in your enterprise. But um, it's just an illustration that you have Hadoop at your core, you're pulling in sort of multiple da uh, data sources, you're integrating with some of those data sources, doing the transformation, doing pushing the logic into it, right? And then maybe feeding it back into your various, uh, uh, you know, we sometimes call it sort of enriching, right? So you do maybe do the, the refining of the data in Hadoop, and once you've refined it, then you can enrich some of your sort of uh, uh, classic sort of data sources like an EDW uh, with that data. So Hadoop, you can use it to store you know, any data for any application and anywhere, right? So you, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud. And today we're going to do it, uh, our lab actually on the um, on our sandbox VM. So it's 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 not a full cluster. It's not a cluster at all. It's one machine, right? Um, so it it, it it runs in sort of in this virtualized environment in that one machine. Um, and so we're going to use that to kind of get started. Um, sort of what's next? So we're going to get going with this uh, crash course. Hopefully, uh, you get, folks get pretty far. Uh, but so after you go through this crash course, you probably want to hit this page, developer.hornworks.com, so to look at your next steps. So it's sort of, I've gone through my crash course, now I, now, now I have some of the basics. I have an environment, I have a sandbox that, that I can use to kind of uh, start doing operations. Now it's like I want to start uh, going deeper, diving into additional topics. And this is a great place to kind of do that. So that's my quick spiel. That's my Twitter. Um, any, any quick questions? So I, I'll, I'm happy to take some questions, but I really, you know, we can also kind of go straight into questions. We're going to have a series of lab proctors that are going to help folks kind of do this. Uh, so where's Robert? So um, where's Rich? So, is that, so Alex, are you, gonna, you want to stand up? And then there's Jules, and there's Ron. There's a couple of folks in the outside that should come over. So you know, there's a bunch of us in here that's gonna, that are here and able to answer questions, whether they're direct questions on the lab or just questions in general about Hadoop and technology. We have a rich uh, team of folks here ready to help you out. Um, so when we look at the lab, you know, it's, it's dealing with this Internet of Things scenario. Right? There's a trucking company. It, it has sensors in the trucks. It's sending uh, GPS data, location data, and it has also some uh, additional uh, structured data around that it can leverage. Uh, and, and really the task today is we want to sort of mitigate risk. Right? We, will look, we will look at uh, truck drivers and trucks. How, long, how many hours is a truck driver driving? How many miles does this truck have? We want to look at events. We want to see if there's a correlation between you know, events and uh, the behavior of the truck drivers. Not, it's, gonna be, it's very fairly sort of crude, it's not quite predictive. Uh, but you know, this is going to start our exploration, right? This is needs a sandbox 2.3. So if you download a sandbox 2.2 and you use these lab instructions, it's not going to work, right? You need the sandbox 2.3, right? So, uh, so everyone should have the, the lab document, have a data set, and we're going to start querying and processing the data, right? So uh, in the lab, you're going to have these two files. You're going to have a geolocation file, CSV and you're going to have a trucks CSV data. And you're going to load that data. When you're going to load that data, it's going to put the data into HDFS. That's right, HDFS. 
So we're gonna put the data into HDFS, right? And we put the data into HDFS, at some point we need to create an abstraction on top of that data we moved into HDFS to interact with it in the SQL fashion, right? And so we're gonna put it in SQL fashion and we're gonna use a tool, Apache, starts with an H, Hive. We're gonna use Hive, right? So Hive is gonna be an abstraction, abstraction to kind of put the data into this relational structure to do SQL operations. And so we're gonna stage the data sort of raw as it came from a CSV, and then we're gonna optimize the data and, and put it in sort of an org file, right? Once we kind of have the data into sort of our optimizations that we want, we're gonna start doing a whole series of processing on that data. So we're gonna see a whole bunch of transformation on our data using sort of SQL. So we're gonna start with the truck data, look at some mileage, driver mileage, average mileage, right? And then we're gonna do, actually do some risk calculation. And to do the risk calculation, we're gonna use pig to, to, to do that. All right, so this is our, our pig job that we're gonna run. And um, so if you look at this pig job, right, we're gonna load the, the geolocation data. We, we have these events, we're gonna filter by the type of events we're looking, we're looking for abnormal events, so not normal, right? Uh, we're gonna kind of process these events. We'll, uh, we're then gonna group by it by the driver itself, right? Then we're gonna start doing some summation on it. Then we're going to also bring in driver mileage, right? So, you know, uh, and then we want to do a joint. So we want to start seeing some relationship between driver mileage and sort of geolocation. And then describe kind of like shows you, tells you the structure that you're dealing with. And then you need to do a dump. So this dump is going to dump it to the screen. And then to do your final, you need to do this calculation to calculate risk, right? And then you can do a store to dump it back into a table risk factor in in, in your sort of environment. So here's the thing for, um, when you do the pig tutorial, what I would suggest is, once you get there, get through it, but I would spend some time, you know, comment, so this, these two dash dash is a comment. So I would start, you know, maybe commenting all the way up, and maybe run it and just do a dump. So hey, I, I do, I run A, and then I want to do a dump A, to kind of see what's the, the, the what's doing, right? So I think of, you know, when, when I was started doing C, it says, dude, printf. I started doing all these printfs, right, to see what's happening, debugging in my environment. In this case, you could use dump to do sort of a similar fashion. So I would suggest, you know, playing with that a little further. So with that, that's, um, if there's no pressing questions, we can kind of break into a lab and kind of get started, start with that at this point. Yes, question. Uh, so, so there's an op optional lab at the end, right? So if you want to do that lab and have Excel, because it requires Excel, then you need to download that driver, right? So that's an optional lab at the end. If you get that far, definitely want to do that. Excuse me? So the, the, there's a difference between the driver and the version of HTTP, right? So, um, so I can walk around afterwards and kind of sit with you, kind of pick that out. There. I think there's another quick question. Oh, one, one, one last question. So uh, we're turning it into something else. So there's a, there's a file structure that ORC kind of provides that has additional sort of metadata and optimization in that structure so that Hive can do more efficient processing on it. Yeah, so we stage a file, and that's the original file, and then we take that staging and then we inject it into org format to kind of have a more optimized file structure. Uh, so uh, what is an org format? So it, it's, it's a file structure format, right? So um, it has a, uh, it collects some metadata, it has an index, right, so it can help uh, do further processing with it. The other, the other sort of feature that ORC does, it, it, it has very efficient uh, compression, right? So as you're storing lots of data, it might be a good idea to compress some of the data. So in, in our case, we're gonna go through the lab, we're not gonna use compression, right? So you'll see it says in a non-compressed sort of flag in there, um, but you can, uh, you can also do compression with it. So, so so the file that gets stored in HDFS, it starts with a CSV file, and we just store it as a raw text file. And then we're gonna kind of uh, uh, 
do a process to kind of put that into a more optimized format in ORC, so we'll have two copies of the data. Okay, so uh, I have zero USB keys. I got one, thank you, sir. One found its way back. So if folks are done copying that, I appreciate getting the USB keys back. They're USB 3 keys, so you know, uh, they're nice keys, and I did that so that you can efficiently do the copying. So with that, we'll get started with the lab, and feel free to ask questions, raise your hand. There's, uh, okay, so, so let me um, stop this. You can stop the recording.